I'm Woody Sklar, and I approve of that uh, public service announcement. Public service announcement. <laughs> oh, if you laugh at any of my poems, it's uh, Dave's fault. <laughs> because um, when I, f I wasn't long, I was, wasn't here very long, and uh, Dave asked, he wanted to see my notebook, and he said, well, why didn't you read this poem, or why didn't you ever send these poems or read these poems? I said, well, because they're funny, and, and, and you know, I want to be taken seriously as a poet. He said, well, humor is serious, okay? So that's that. I'm going to... Uh, <laughs> these are in chronological order, except for the first one, the story of my life. The story of my life. I knew they'd be closed. It was half, it was 10 past five. I went there anyhow. Sure enough, the door was locked, but they let me in. Giovanni, now here's another uh, inf good influence on me, Giovanni Gabucci, also known as John Cabbage. Uh, I went to my first uh, open reading and I, dis I was planning on reading a poem until I, I thought, Oh no, I'm not going to get. I don't. At least I'm glad nobody knows. But then after a while, uh, I thought, well, those guys aren't that great. I could, mine's, mine's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, mine's at least as good as theirs. So, <laughs> and oh, uh, anyhow, he came uh, up to me after the reading and invited me over to his place, and he wanted to look at my notebook, and he said, "You have." He said, "Why are these lines so short?" Like you have this long breath and these long lines. Why, why? I said, well, I don't know. Robert Creeley is right that way and a lot of people. He said, well, that's not your style. So, and I was influenced by Robert Creeley's uh, short lines, which is not that big a thing to be influenced by. But at the time, oh, I was new. Uh, I was just, I had written along uh, for quite a while, but I was just starting to come out with, you know, in public. Okay, John, uh, Giovanni Gabucci, a.k.a. John Cabbage. Poet John Cabbage talking about Max Bodenheim harvesting the Dakotas, shipping out to sea, about organizing unions before there were any, about Bob White and his fight for the underdog. John Cabbage getting beat up, dumped on foreign shore, walking the Bowery, talking with Charlie Chaplin, writing poems on garbage scows, interviewed by Dag Hammarskjöld, John Cabbage talking about contemporary hippies, sorry, about contemporary poetry, goddamn hippies, thinking the underdog has lost. Oh, that, uh, the first section is called After My Fall from Gracelessness, okay? <laughs> Next section is called uh, Following My Nose. Uh, it's just, I didn't do this on purpose, but the first poem is The Smell of Life. But <laughs> it's one of those happy accents. Okay. Oh, actually, okay, this poem was written 10 years after my final trip to Manhattan General uh, Detox, okay, which ran into what became a Phoenix House therapeutic community. Hi, John. <laughs> And everybody else, and birthday. Rebecca and Steve. It's his birthday. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the smell of life, rubbing alcohol, and a breeze at an open window. February day. Rubbing alcohol, and infrared heated beef mashed potatoes and string beans. Much the same as rubbing alcohol, ham, french fries, and broccoli. Later, on the way to the TV room or the gymnasium, in striped cotton robe, my breath tastes like dinner, like all the dinners. <coughs> the alcohol touches at once, tonsillectomy, mother's hemorrhage, my electroshock therapy, heroin, hepatitis, and awakens fear, but is inexplicably reassuring, like the odor of gasoline and sewage near lower west side service stations and piers where our family car sometimes took us to relatives across the river 
furry arm of my mother, aftershave of my father, standing midstream at the prow of the ferry, a breeze across our faces. Now talking about um, inspirations for poems, this one's called uh, Ode to Goofy. And um, uh, it was just a dripping faucet, I don't know. <laughs> it wasn't like, you know, unlike some poems like Love Affairs. And just, so uh, that's, I guess, that's when, you're young, when you're young and you're a poet, but anything you get, you know. <laughs> oh, Goofy tap dancing in the kitchen in the moonlight of streetlight to the dripping faucet, a song of environmental unconcern, beauty of waste. Oh, Coney Island, 25 cents laughing entrance to fear, thrill of dying, a dozen clams on a half shell, hot sauce, Daffy Duck salt water taffy, three shots for a quarter, ragdoll reward, midnight of the eternal steeplechase, trashed windy, Black top of the sauerkraut, mustard, cotton, candy, night, oh, light. Star travelers of Brooklyn taking the subway home. Moonlight on the oil slick. Mark Twain of the green, green Condom River. Ellis Island ghosts, liberty, oh, say, can you see? Feels good reading these out loud. Mm -hmm. Feb that was February 77. There's another food poem. Give me hamburger or give me death. <laughs> <laughs> hamburger and eggs, please. What's a nice hamburger like you doing in a place like this? <laughs> Gee, you have the loveliest hamburger. We could make beautiful hamburger together. <laughs> Would you like to go to the hamburger tonight? Is your hamburger living? Did you go hamburger for the holidays? <laughs> My hamburger wouldn't start up this morning. It's a lovely day for a hamburger. Does your hamburger know you're here? <laughs> Does your hamburger bite? <laughs> Is your hamburger all older than you? <laughs> Do you play the hamburger? Why did the hamburger cross the road? Excuse me, I have to make a hamburger. A hamburger, well done. Is there a hamburger in the house? Seek first the kingdom of hamburger. <laughs> Leave the key under the hamburger. May I have change of a hamburger? Make hamburger, not war. A hamburger a day keeps the doctor away, huh? <laughs> hamburger makes the heart grow fonder. Everything you wanted to know about hamburger but were afraid to ask. I pledge allegiance to the hamburger. A hamburger is a joy forever. Uh, so this is in, uh, in, in, in the Berg. And this is from 1980. Caffeine, nicotine, meat, and warm bodies partaking of nourishment. This ain't the sheep's head with its quiche, espresso, imported beer, classical music, art, student paintings, natural wood decor, outdoor tables, hanging plants, exquisitely thin slivers of rich pie at mod prices, and stylishly slow service slow service. And this ain't Simmy's with its arty patron photo portraits, garbanzo bean burgers, and hot apple cider, 10% juice, but swell glasses and a sprinkle of cinnamon. This is just old Hamburg Inn in my adopted city of Iowa City. I know I should have gone home as usual after jogging in calisthenics and made some stone ground whole wheat, cor cornmeal, buttermilk, pancakes topped with honey and peaches, and brewed some organic French roast coffee, but shit. I'm a working man, and a man living alone. I just wanted someone to fix my meal, and hamburgers are in my jeans, and an older woman in a dress is in my memory bank. Besides, poison is good for you. Sometimes, hamburger and coffee give the liver and kidneys a workout just as the muscles and respiratory systems are worked when labored with exercise. 
And I like to ask someone once in a while to pass the ketchup, or are you going to use that ashtray? <laughs> and it's nice to leave the dishes for someone else to wash for a change. And even leaving a tip is a kind of communication. You want to show off your grandma's dress, or your Jordache jeans, or raggedy neo-hippie cutoffs, headband and slouch? Go to the sheep's head or Simmy's. Someone there will appreciate you or hate you for being more different than they are. But hey, you probably enjoy getting together with your friends at a place you like. And I'm no snob. I'm not saying that Hamburg Inn is the end all be and be all of eating establishments. And we might even run it to each other at a dollar fifty flick at the Bijou, which at a Greenwich Village art theater would be six dollars. Then someone might ask, might talk about us. Someone had, who eats at Mr. Steak. Okay. Thank you. And uh, uh, I like, I guess I have, I like long titles. Ozark DC 9 St. Louis to New York City. Um, 1983. Unfasten the seat belt. Square your feet upon six miles of space. The air vent system ebbs and flows like an old fan in a warehouse you worked in when jet planes were the new thing. Or is it the engine that ebbs and flows? And is it supposed to? Should you report this to the pilot? The flight attendant might not take you seriously after a million miles of tending to thousands of fears. You're the one who noticed vibrations in the old Buick given to you and your first wife by her parents and pulled into a service station on the interstate to learn that the drive shaft was an inch from falling out and could have catapulted us. Tell the pilot or write a poem <laughs> to be found possibly in smoldering rubble. <laughs> Luckily, that didn't happen. <laughs> Outside your window, the wing, a 30-foot length of simple, perfect construction, the color of galvanized zinc, nuts, bolts, corner braces, mending plates, screws, spring washers, and what have you, stored, in loose, stored loose in drawers, not bubble-packed, binding artifacts of our civilization, objects you handle piece by piece when packing orders and taking inventory in your father's one-man wholesale hardware store. Your window reflects upon that wing a vision of fish pastry, an escarole lettuce on an orange tray. This kind of surrealism you don't need. You're still taken, simply, taken by simply existing. You remain a primitive in matters of life and death, even with the existence of a 50-year-old flight attendant, which civilizes most people. You prefer the living room sofa feet upon the carpet. Takeoff was like an intravenous blast of amphetamine called speed on the street. And descending to LaGuardia was indeed coming down, another street term, this for the wearing off of drug effects, also called crashing. The reduced engine revolutions and attending lower pitch of engine sounds perceived by an infrequent flyer as mechanical failure <laughs> <laughs> while your stomach descended into the lower intestine. The aircraft seemed to have stalled over a New Jersey Con Edison landscape, hanging there like a skyscraper elevator st stuck between floors. You've taken all the chances you want to ever, probably ever want to take for love in riding a motorcycle many times to Riverside, Iowa, down Highway 218, that narrow two-laner with windy shutters of approaching semi-trailers, for excitement as a child climbing through the classroom window at night for cookies and cookie money, as a teenager jumping out of airplanes in the 82nd Airborne, for life and shooting up speed and junk in the 60s, then settling into writing poetry and being a small press publisher. Now in the 48th year of your life, twice the age of the average poetry reading attendee and of your ex-wife and the entire life expectancy of most ancient Romans, 
you should put your life on the line for convenience. Here rests Morty Sklar, who saved 36 hours round trip. <laughs> Thank you. And a couple, uh, well, at least one person is here that's in this poem. Uh, Things I thought were bad for us. Competition. Hot dogs. We want the Quad City Cubs to win, but are caught off guard and cheer for any snappy hit and expertly fielded ball. When we leave the park, John's organic trail mix is still unopened in his backpack. Thanks. And on, on being a grown-up, uh, I don't know, that this is May 86. I'm still in Iowa City. <coughs> on being a grown-up. It's okay. Take your time. <laughs> no, that cough comes first. <clears throat> on being a grown-up. A man likes having become a grown-up after being an adolescent, sort of, for 40 years. But then he doesn't like it as much when so often he must be even more grown-up. He used to think grown-up was a place of arrival where one enjoys the rewards, such as acceptance of oneself and others, and takes stock of the responsibilities, like maintaining grown-upness in the face of adolescence. But grown-upness, like love, is not only a state, but a job, sort of. And as such, paying attention to details is important, whether in lathing a machine part to within 0.0017 millimeter tolerance, or getting the dirt out of a corner. Well, that's OK, as it should be for a grown-up. But then, sometimes the man wants to call his mother, to confide in her as a child or as a friend. But his mother is now 86, no longer a grown-up. Grown the man has been feeling blue, even having friends, and dissatisfied even with his work going tolerably well. So he is reminded to call his mother, who too has been blue. Thank you. OK. Feeling good, what's it good for? <laughs> I know it sounds pessimistic, but <laughs> I feel good. <laughs> Feeling good is a mini vacation. On a regular vacation, you do things. With a mini, you don't have to do anything. Not doing anything feels good when most of the time you've been doing everything. Feeling good, what's it good for? <clears throat> if it's good for nothing, then that's good enough for me. It's good to feel good with others, but it's better to feel good alone than not to feel good at all. When you don't feel good, it seems that no one else does either. So it's good for helping others feel good. How do I get to feel good? Or do you get to feel good? Beats me, I do things that sometimes make me feel good, but other times don't. Weirdly enough, my acceptance of that feels good, or keeps me from feeling bad. <coughs> Uh, March, thank you. March, uh, March 1989. Uh, that's not long before I left Iowa City. Oh, in fact, the next section is called You Can Go Home Again. Poem for Last Love. <clears throat> it is. It, it is as though I'm experiencing a feedback loop in my harmonic configuration. That's data in Star Trek. <laughs> the mysteries of space, outer, warped, and sub, are data's milieu. How do we rem remain so enwrapped with each episode of Star Trek, the next generation, without comprehending the science of it? By the way the characters relate to the science and to each other, the latter of which is a mystery to data. Most people want to be something, a writer, a firefighter, a starship officer. Data, a starship officer, wants to be somebody, not somebody important or well-known, but somebody human. 
<laughs> he, the most advanced android ever, experienced a feedback experiencing a feedback loop in my harmonic configuration is as fascinating to watch in his first stirrings of romantic love as his shipmates are in grappling with a newly encountered galaxy or life form. Data gives a poetry reading. His shipmates are, ship, his shipmates are at best polite. When he attempts to discover his audience's impressions, he learns that the, his poetry is considered interesting and well put together, but too cerebral. Was that because he's an android? Not necessarily. He'd made the mistake most of us make when first we write poetry. He generalized too much. It's funny about androids and replicants, such as the one Harrison Ford's character falls in love with in Blade Runner, and the Rutger Hauer character there, who is high, the highly evolved leader of the rebel replicants and is doomed as they are to die at age 12. They're basically like the rest of us, living out life's dream dramas destined to die. Perhaps the replicant detection test, based on a replicant's having little in his past to allow him to relate to very common human situations because he has no past other than what his, was implanted in his brain by his human guards. It, <clears throat> if applied to some residents at Building P in Creedmoor State Hospital would result in false positives. By the same token, if the replicant leader, whose last act was to spare the life of the Blade Runner who killed the other replicants and mortally wounded him, was placed side by side with the human who shot in the back and killed a bicyclist in Prospect Park in Brooklyn, the average person would guess wrong as to who was human, though perhaps not the film reviewing team of Siskel and Ebert. Of that movie, Siskel said, it was pretty to look at for about 15 minutes. Albert disagreed. Ebert disagreed, saying it was pretty enough to watch for its entire length. If the reviewers were human, then they were in denial because the Blade Runner's heart throbs, having been a replicant, prevented them from being touched by the quite natural and sympathetic relationship that had evolved into love, a relationship more moving than many between two humans, whether in the movies or in life. And it also prevented them from paying tribute to their kind of hero, the altruistic, passionate, and courageous leader of the replicants. What would Data think of my relationship to Marcella? If he could bring on screen my romance history, what would he make of, on the one hand, my many love poems, even for relationships that never got started, and on the other hand, not one for Marcella? Until today. He might understand if he saw that I wrote the first poem for my mother when I was 35, and then only after she coerced me. You wrote such a beautiful poem for your father. Why can't you write one for me? <laughs> to which I replied, Mom, I'm an artist. I can't just sit down and write a poem when somebody asks me to. To which she replied, I'm not somebody. I'm your mother. <laughs> 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 and thus was born my first occasional poem and a deeper understanding of poetry, which enables me to write this today. That was uh, June 1993. It was a year after I met Marcella, my trophy wife. <laughs> Thanks. Um, well, here's a, my mother poem. <clears throat> we used to say left back when someone I uh, didn't progress to the next, and then someone told me it's. Oh, sorry. We used to see, say a person was left back, which actually I was in the first grade, but luckily I met my best friend that because of that. But someone told me it's held back, and so I put that in the title. I don't know. My mother said she was held back. <clears throat> my mother stopped eating. Eating was the last sign of her tenacity, the last expression of her passionate being except for rare outbursts of, I love you, or grabbing your hand or anyone's and kissing it. I say that first she died, then she quit eating. What she was chewing in her last years didn't provide the nourishment she craved. It's amazing that she went on for so long. 
perhaps what would have killed her had she lived longer, also kept her from an insight that would have caused her to despair, or maybe a relentless, incommunicable despair that inhabited her being was refracted through the, the prism of her dauntless soul into ecstasy or peace. I had witnessed 54 years earlier in the Catskill Mountains, my mother leaning over the side of a hospital bed and into a pan that my father held, throw up 65% of her blood. I'd slowly approached her as she was wheeled from her room, an angelic look upon her face, a wan smile. She said to me, don't worry, Mickey, I'll be all right. Our mother's food tray card, this was back to, back in the present, or rather, this wasn't the 54 year ago time. Uh, double portions. And until she stopped eating, she scoffed every morsel, no matter what, and when the last spoonful was gone, licked the spoons, the cups, the bowls. If you put your hand on her arm and asked, how's it going, Mom, she'd brush it aside. You're going to eat me out of house and home, I would tell her, as she once told my brother and me. She also used to say, all I have to do is look at food, and I gain weight. And for more than 10 years, she'd been eating everything in sight, even off someone else's tray when a new orderly sat her too close to one. But her five foot one inches found its equilibrium at 98 pounds. I wonder if the plaque and snarls in her 95 year old brain prevented her from appreciating that irony. I wouldn't bet on it. I don't give up on anyone, especially she who hadn't given up on me, even when I'd given up on myself. People will surprise you. Like when I said to my mother a year ago, when she was dressed in calf-high white socks and a girlish dress, Mom, you look like a schoolgirl today. And she glanced at me, then turned her gaze to the tabletop in front of her and shouted, yeah, I was held back. <laughs> <laughs> That was uh, 1974. Uh, sorry, 1994. Andina, my flower of the Andes, as a young woman danced to Glenn Miller in her birthplace in Peru, while I listened to the same on the radio in Elmhurst, New York City. She came to the U.S. in the same year I emigrated from the land of Nod, both of us embarking on new lives then meeting in the building where we both live. Citizens then, for 25 years, our immigrant hearts embraced. And um, I only have a few more to read. My Selmer Mark VI alto saxophone. I don't recall if I'd played all the things you are or just sang in be the beginning and hummed and scattered the rest. I can't say that Rick, Doug, Audrey, Dr. Dick, Carlos, Dan, Chuck, Jim, and I, and whoever else might show up <coughs> had played songs when we jammed in the bungalow that Rick bought for $5,000 in Iowa City on Bowery Street between Gilbert and Lynn or in the downtown mini park before the new Godfather's Pizza boosted the economy but took from us the park's ambience by removing the bushes we'd played among. Or at Carlos's pad, so small for our congas and bongos, the saxophone guitars, both, both electrified and acoustic, the Goodwill toy piano and kazoo, and we singing, chanting, shouting, stomping, fueled by weed, espressos, friendship, youth, and freedom. No, not all, not whole songs did we play, even when Carlos and Jim, real musicians, kicked us off with one. But it was music, once we got up ahead of steam. Or call it good enough for jazz, but whatever. They can't take that away from me. <clears throat> I confess, I never played in its entire, a song in its entirety. 
I played scales in the back of my father's store after hours. And then my first apartment at 81st Street in Columbus in Manhattan. Then I played the pawn shop tune to cop heroin and the parents jingle when I gave to mine the pawn tickets for their wedding silverware. I always held on to my saxophone tickets. One day I was again practicing scales in my Prospect Park West Brooklyn basement apartment after graduating from Phoenix House uh, drug program. And then in a $40 a month room on West 20th before leaving New York, where my next door Basque neighbor tried to push my door in when he'd lost his job and came home drunk in the afternoon wanting to sleep it off. I practiced in Iowa City in some of the 12 places I lived, the last of which was the home of Jack and Shirley's, who'd invited me to stay until I could load all my possessions on a rider rental truck and move back to New York. I took music lessons from Jim Mulock until the day Jack said, Morty, are you ever going to New York? <laughs> now for Marcella, I sometimes play my sax for, to salsa or jazz that's on the radio or a record. And I play the flute she, she, brought, she brought me from Peru, Peru, and the pan flute she bought me in Russia. I listen to a lot of radio programs from alternative medicine to politics, personal and financial counseling, religion. One day, when all the words begin to sound like noise, I hit the Newark jazz station and I take out my sax to join in. My musician, Marcella says. That was December, uh, <laughs> that was uh, December 1997. Uh, 9 -1 -1, a few miles from Ground Zero. On Sunday, we watched The Triumph of the Spirit, a story of the Holocaust. On Monday, we saw Traffic, the War on Drugs. On Tuesday, we witnessed the World Trade Center to Twin Towers collapse. A man and woman held hands, leaped from the upper floors. Woman to reporter, I want to dig him out with my hands. What if he's dying and I can't hold him in my arms? On waking this morning, I felt that some part of my body was missing. New York City, the United States of America, yesterday slept, slipped on a landmine and lost a limb. Hijacker to passenger on American Airlines, flight 11. Call your wife and tell her you're going to die. Repetition of video footage, planes crashing into both towers, fire, and the genie-like cloud of smoke hovering above its wounds, then crash into the streets with the upper floors. Repetition of verbal reportage and anecdotal uh, accounts, repetition as with the O.J. Simpson murder trial, and in automobile ads, serial ads, deodorant ads, and in news that is not news, repetition that has infuriated me more and more as I, older I get, now becomes a rosary of reiteration. Like my father's in synagogue on Yom Kippur, his words repeated, Baruch HaTor Adonai, Elheinu Melech Olam, Blessed art thou, O Lord our God. His repeated bows from the waist, his fist upon his chest. Repetition we don't seem to tire of, not only because the event is too momentous to grasp all at once, but because we're here to tell about it. Okay. Oh, last poem, come on. Brad Meldow at Carnegie Hall. I tell Marcella that my Charlie Parker t-shirt is in the laundry basket or else I'd wear it. <laughs> she, who never tells me what I should wear, really even hints at it, says, you ought to wear a shirt and tie to Carnegie Hall. But it's a jazz concert, I say. It doesn't matter, it's Carnegie Hall. <laughs> I tell her I'm usually overdressed at prestigious halls that even guys my age don't wear jackets or ties. She says nothing. I consider my Ellis Island t-shirt with its hundred flags, but put on a starch shirt, tie, and jacket and feel okay about it. At Carnegie Hall, Brad and his trio are introduced and come onto the stage, all wearing t-shirts. <laughs>
<laughs> okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot.